Welcome to this grab bag on cognitive load theory. Dylan Williams says that Sweller's cognitive load theory is the single most important thing for teachers to know. So I suppose we better know about it. So what is cognitive load theory? Let me begin with a hideously simplistic analogy, but one that hopefully will make sense to you and give you a quick introduction to the essential idea of cognitive load theory. Let's say I hire a storage unit because I've got lots of things to store away. I start with a storage unit with lots of space for storing stuff, and here are my boxes. In order to fill that space, I need to load my boxes onto a trolley and wheel them along the corridors, up and down in the lift, and, and so on. And I do this so I can put them where I want to store them. There's a system I'm working to, but never mind that for now. So then once I've stored these boxes, my trolley's empty again, and I can go and get more stuff. Now then, let's say in this analogy that my storage unit is the size of London. Does that now mean that I can store my belongings faster? No, because there's a limiting factor. And what is that limiting factor? The limiting factor is that I'm still totally, totally reliant on the capacity of the trolley. The whole process is limited by this single factor. How much load can the trolley handle? Now, in this analogy, the storage unit is my long-term memory. To all intents and purposes, it has an infinite storage capacity. And the trolley is my working memory. It definitely does have a limited capacity. So if I'm going to fill my long-term memory store with the elements that I'm trying to learn, I need to use my working memory as efficiently as possible. So first of all, I need to ensure that I'm not overloading my working memory because I'm going to drop some boxes or have to leave, leave some behind. That's known as cognitive overload. In this case, those elements that I'm trying to learn are just not going to be transferred into my long-term memory. The second thing I need to ensure is that I'm not underloading my working memory as this will just simply slow down the whole process and it will become slow and arduous and a little bit boring. So cognitive load theory indicates to us how to optimize our teaching for this exact purpose, to maximize the efficiency of our working memory. So how do we work within the constraints of working memory and still ensure that our students are learning, filling up that long-term memory as efficiently as possible? Right, it's time for another parcel-based analogy. If I wanna send a parcel, I know that the cost of sending the parcel is based on its weight, or its bulk, its load, if you prefer. So the overall weight or load of my parcel is the weight of the item that I'm sending plus the weight of the packaging. I'm not going to send a tiny little item in a huge, heavy packing container, you know, unless I'm Amazon, of course. Um, no, I'm going to send the item in packaging that is sufficient for the job, but not unnecessarily heavy or cumbersome. Well, why is that? It's because it's the item that I'm trying to transport. The packaging is just necessary for the process. Now take this across to your understanding of cognitive load theory. Every time we ask our students to learn something in our lessons, every time we give them a package of learning, if you will, to transfer into their long-term memory, we're giving them a cognitive load, which we're asking them to process and store. Reef in 2020 put it like this. The cognitive load involved in a task is the cognitive effort or the amount of information processing required by a person to perform this task. That cognitive load is made up of the demand of the content, which is kind of like the weight of the item, and the demand of the task, which is like the weight of the packaging. Now, if that load is mostly packaging, you know, like with our friends at Amazon, we're being really inefficient with the, with the learning process. What do I mean? Let's say you've got a fairly simple idea to teach. That's the item that you want to send. And you package it really elaborately. That is, the task is really complex and difficult to do. You might have experienced this where you set your students on a task and they immediately say, what do I have to do? Maybe you've packaged your simple idea as... I don't know, an hour-long murder mystery investigation or a multi-stop carousel with different tasks at each station or a 50-piece card sort or a papier-mâché model of a U-shaped value or something like this. The packaging 
in those instances doesn't serve the content. The task is too convoluted for the content. And this makes the learning both at risk of overloading the student's processing capacity and also at risk of just being a really inefficient use of their time. Now, there are some benefits to those kinds of tasks under certain conditions, but that's not the point of this video. We'll come back to that another time. Let's just note some technical terms at this point for future reference. The term we give to the load induced by the packaging of the task is extraneous load. It's not the stuff we really want them to store in their long-term memories, but it's the load induced by the way it's being presented to them. The second key term here is intrinsic load. And this just means the difficulty or the complexity that is inherent in the content itself. Now, this is very difficult to quantify, but you'll have a good experiential idea of what stuff is complicated in your subject and what stuff's a bit more straightforward. And you can alter the extraneous load of your tasks accordingly. Ultimately, you're aiming to present tasks to your students that optimize the intrinsic load whilst reducing the extraneous load. So what are some strategies that might arise from an understanding of cognitive load theory? Very simply and quickly. You need to present new material in small chunks because of the processing required for new material. Secondly, you need to check for understanding often, again, especially with new material to ensure that no misconceptions creep in and that students aren't dropping boxes on the way to their long term memory. And finally, we need to reduce extraneous load through the clarity of our instruction. And there's lots of ways of doing that, including routine and dual coding and other uh, features and ways of doing it. Well, there's lots more to learn um, about the theory than this, but that is quite enough cognitive load for one video. So I'll leave you some time to process this. Here are some references that you might want to chase up, but that's it for now. And I'll see you next time.